You elected a chairman that can't take himself off mute. Good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Greg Musil. I'm the chair of the 2021 Johnson County Charter Commission. Welcome to the commissioners and those of you who are joining us by Facebook uh, to observe the meeting today. We look forward to everybody's participation, not only today, but as this process continues uh, through the summer um, and into the fall, but hopefully not completely into the winter, uh, if we can help it. Uh, our meeting today started at four o'clock. Um, the first item on the agenda is roll call to determine a quorum. Linda, would you please call the roll? Wendy Bengasser. Wendy Bengasser, present. Mike Bame. Mike Bame, present. Karen Brownlee. Karen Brownlee. She's actually in the waiting room. Hold on just one second here. We had, we had just a few more people coming in. Okay, we're at Karen Brownlee. I'll come back to her, here. Vicki. Uh, Karen, thank you. Vicki Charlesworth? Here. Jim Denning? Jim Denning, here. Jane Dirks? Jane Dirks, here. Jimmy Gaona? Jimmy Gaona, here. Tedrick Housh? Housh, here. Randy Hutchins? Randy Hutchins, here. Chris Eiliff? Here. Laura Klingensmith? Laura Klinging Smith here. Joy Coaston. Joy Coaston here. Brent McCune. Brent McCune is here. Eric Michelson. <coughs> Eric Michelson is here. Ed Peterson. Ed Peterson is here. Don Rattan. Don Rattan is here. Dan, thank you. Leslie Riverola. Leslie, are you in, in the meeting? I'll check in a little bit. Don Roberts. Don Roberts. Kyle Russell. Kyle Russell, present. Paula Schwack. Paula Schwack, present. Brenda Sharp. Brenda Sharp, present. Greg Shelton. Greg Shelton, present. Greg Smith. Greg Smith here. Zach Thomas. Zach Thomas present. And Leslie was here. Oh, she just sent a message. Her audio's not connecting, but she's present in the Zoom. Okay. And Chairman Musel. Chairman Musel here. Okay. And do we have Don Roberts? I do not show Don Roberts being in attendance. Okay. So it looks like we have 24 present and Don Roberts is not in the meeting at this time. Thank you. Please try to reflect when Don joins us. Thank you all for your diligence and being at our, I'm already, I think this is our third meeting or fourth meeting, fourth meeting. Um, we're here, the, the, you have the agenda in front of you that that is a plan to get you the agenda at least the Friday before if not sooner, um, in the minutes, soon enough so you can look at those. The first item on the agenda is to approve uh, the 2000, well, I'm gonna flip those around. The first thing we probably ought to do is approve the agenda. Does anybody have any additions or corrections to the agenda as published? And if not, would somebody make a motion to approve that? I'll move to accept, sorry. Okay. Motion by Joy Coaston. Yeah, Seconded by Zach Clements. Seconded by Zach. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. We'll proceed on the agenda as it was uh, published. Second item then would be approval of the April 28, 2021 minutes. You, you received an original set of minutes um, and then we received some some information about uh, clarification of how we were going, how we had discussed handling website comments. Uh, I sent a suggestion back to Linda about how I thought we had 
and agreed to handle those and she sent those out in an email. So let's, uh, let's assume it's the, the minutes as revised by Linda's email. And are there any questions about that or any other additions or corrections? If not, is there a motion to approve the minutes as uh, submitted and then revised? So moved. Brenda Sharp, so moved, or second. Okay. Uh, Pat, uh, moved by Eric Michelson and seconded by Brenda Sharp. Any discussion? If not, those in favor say aye. 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 Those no. We are clicking along today. The motion passes. The minutes have been approved. Um, we've got, we have five items of new business before we get to our presentation. I want to get through those uh, expeditiously if we can so we can get to our presenters today. The first one is about future meetings. Um, uh, county staff has been looking at alternatives where we can meet and be sufficiently social distance and also have the technology to do uh, both make sure we were virtually visible to the public, but also uh, hopefully available to participate for members of the commission who weren't able to attend in person. Um, one of the first questions we received with that is, I think, is there anyone, we, we talked about sending a doodle poll and just decided we're all adults, so we'll all answer the questions. Is there anybody here that's uncomfortable uh, we're trying to figure out if we need to have a Zoom alternative for members. Is there anybody here that we be uncomfortable with a an in-person meeting if we were masked and social distanced? Please, I'm, not Chairman, able, I'm not able to wear a mask for that length of times, but I'm happy to meet if I don't have to wear a mask. Uh, Jane Durks. Thank you, Jane. That, the next question is going to be, are you, are you comfortable attending a meeting if some of the members aren't masked and we try to um, deal with that by the social distancing? So thank you, thank you, Jane. Uh, um, Joy. Uh, thank you, Chairman Musil. I, uh, I would like to uh, promote the idea that we still have a Zoom alternative um, for some of us who do are out of town uh, or if for some reason we might feel a little uncomfortable about around being people, being with people who have not yet had their vaccination or wear a mask. So um, I would like that alternative still to be, I, I, I'll be there in person when possible, but I certainly would like a Zoom alternative. Chairman, Jimmy Gaona here. Uh, I concur with that, especially just with vacations and such or a conference call line. I don't know how you could do that live streaming, but something like that. I think our plan is to do exactly that and we'll proceed that way. What, what our goal is, is to make sure everybody can participate to, in a comfortable way, regardless of, of uh, whether they're in, in person or by Zoom. Um, I don't know, if, don't know if Maury is on. Maury, do you have any update on potential locations? I am uh, Chairman Maury Thompson, Deputy County Manager here. Staff are working with staff at the uh, University of Kansas Edwards Center making good progress. It appears that they may be able to accommodate us. We need to, we're at the point, need to go over and physically look at it and look at their microphone capabilities now. But again, it appears that they may be able to provide uh, the structure and uh, setup we need. Well, we'll, we'll continue pursuing that alternative with an in-person location. I don't know that we'll get there on a scheduling basis by May 26th, but that would be our goal um, and still have a Zoom alternative for anybody that uh, wished to participate by Zoom. So any other questions or comments about that issue of location and in-person as well as virtual? Next item is website review. Um, this is an item that was on the agenda last time and the chair simply skipped over. Um, so we're going to address that now and let Linda tell us what our, where, where we are with respect to going live with the website. All right, let me share my screen here. Uh, 
Um, a few, it's pretty much what we had before. Um, I still do need to, um, some of the items that uh, the chairman has requested on the contact, um, my technology person had been on vacation. And so I will in the next day or two work with her so that those items that the chairman added to the meeting, such as giving them an email that states um, that, that we have received their um, comments and also that they will be passed along to all the commissioners, um, those types of things we will get added to this. Um, the other thing that I wanted to show you is our meetings list. Uh, what we have out there now um, is we have it such as the date of the meeting. I'll be able to, the agendas will be posted here and they are now, except once we go live, the public's going to be able to see this and so will you guys. Um, I will still send out an email to you, to all the commissioners that includes the um, agenda and the agenda packet, but it will be here on the website. The minutes pending um, will be loaded here. I have the March 1st and the April 12th that still need to be loaded by my technology person um, for those there, but this is where I will load the signed minutes. Um, as you can tell here, we have the videos from the meetings that are here that people then can go out and watch those um, each time. So uh, that's what we have loaded there. Um, one second here. Um, I do, there's also a tab that has all the meetings. So this will be where someone can go and look at all the future meetings. They won't show up on that other page that where I attach the agenda and the agenda um, packet and those types of things until it's rather close to that day. But this gives someone the option to go out there and look for the dates that we have scheduled at this time for all future meetings. Um, they also, we will have it also out there, a calendar view that somebody can get to it from that um, um, view. Um, current charter and resources. Um, last time I had already added this, it's out there. We have, of course, we already have the home rule charter, the start, charter statutes. I have the 2000 charter commission report now. We have the 2011 Charter Commission report, and then we have the 2011 Charter Commission minutes that are out there that can be viewed. That one does drop down into more documents for the Charter Commission meetings so that people or yourselves can review those. Um, we still have the member list here that um, is out there for the public once it goes public that they can see and also see who um, each person was appointed by. Um, again, on the front page of the website, um, we have other ways, you know, a different way that people can see the next meeting and connect to that agenda, members, and the documents. Um, there's also still on the front of this website some um, it, Welcome to the Johnson County Charter Commission with some information and then there's history. Um, so that part has not changed. Um, so this is where I will be adding um, what I explained earlier about so that people can contact you guys and we will give that notice um, that has be been requested in the minutes. Um, so as we go further, um, some of these, um, like with the meetings, um, one other thing that I would like to get done at some point, and it just ha hasn't been updated yet, haven't had a chance to work with my technology group um, with her being on vacation, but um, there, I possibly there may be another column where, um, such as like last week, Penny Postick Ferguson's PowerPoint, any documents or PowerPoints that are shown during the meeting, which I don't usually have um, available at the time that I do the agenda packet. 
Um, I would add those as documents that someone could pull out here and see. So I would go back and attach Penny's um, document here. And then also tonight, um, we will have a couple more PowerPoints and a document from the sheriff. So those types of things I plan on adding. Um, my impression right now would be this would be the best place to put it and see if we can do another column or somehow attach those documents here so that um, either yourselves or the public could go back and see those documents, whether it's a PowerPoint or whether it's a document. So um, that is an addition that I will be making to this. So what um, I think with Chairman Musil is I would like to be given permission um, even though it's going to be probably a continuous thing of updating this as we go further and different requests are made or different documents are presented to you guys. I would like to um, hopefully get the okay of the commission tonight to make this public within the next few days so that the public can see it. And then also this can be somewhere when uh, we get questions about things or people are wanting to have one location where they can go and see when the meetings are, what the agenda is. And this would be the place that I would consider um, publication of the agenda, the agenda packet. Of course, we will still have the meetings listed on the BOCC calendar that we keep updated and we'll have um, information on it too, but um, because we do wanna publicize it as much as possible and our PIO department is also um, publishing things for us to promote um, that we're having these meetings. Um, so that would be my request tonight is um, for the commission to authorize me to make this um, website public. And Dawn has, a, has her hand up. Linda, this looks amazing and very user-friendly. Uh, I have a question that may be putting the cart before the horse, but once we uh, finalize item number three, our rules of order, where would those be placed for um, ease of finding them? My first thought would be is to put them out here on the current charter and resources. That way it's another document and we would list it here as the 2021 rules of order. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I agree, I think that's a good part. Okay. Linda, the other, the other thing I thought about was, will there be someplace here easily visible where someone, if they come to the Charter Commission page, would then find the link to the next meeting, the, the, to the county Facebook? Um, I think we should, um, let me think about that, but that's a good point. I'll make sure that a link would be loaded here that would connect them to the Facebook Live. And then I'm always worried about if someone wants to search it, if they wanted to come back and search what Sheriff Hayden is presenting today and you typed in Sheriff, would you get it? Um, and I, that's your IT people just making sure that the, the word searches get to where, get logically to where somebody should. Now we're not gonna have a ton of information like you search Sheriff on the Johnson County full website, but a search function that actually functions is one of the things that I often find is a problem with the website. But this is this is well structured and, and simple and um, we have a pretty defined role. So I think this is good. Other questions or comments on the website? And, and if you have a concern about publishing it in this form, let us know, let me know that too. Because I think by consensus, we'll just go ahead and let Linda do this. Um, after we address any concerns that I hear. And Chairman Musil, um, one thing that hopefully maybe that would also clear up is if I use this page to um, somehow code these PowerPoint documents or documents that are presented on here, hopefully if they're named properly, and we have them out there, someone could scroll through this meeting, this meeting list and see that like the sheriff's presentation PowerPoint or however I named those to make sure that they're explicit of 
um, hopefully someone would see that very clearly. Right. Questions or comments from the group? My, my only comment is I know when I look at county commission agendas, it's helpful to just click right on the links there on, on the agenda um, after the fact. Is that possible at all? Uh, this right here? Uh-huh. That should bring up the document. You mean, you mean the link to the packet, Brenda? Yeah, the, well, I mean, the, yeah, I, I do like that with the agenda with the link to the act on the actual agenda item. So like on the agenda oh. under sheriff's presentation, if you clicked on sheriff's presentation, it would take you to the link from the agenda to the appropriate supporting doc. But if that's not possible, that's okay. I will check on this, but um, this is not an actual agenda management system such as that I use with the BOCC. Most of this is manual that I'm creating. Okay. Um, so that may not be possible. Um, That's okay. This this is great. I'm just lazy and I like the, the county's agenda. Option. Yeah, it does work well. Um, if I can, I will, I will look into that. Otherwise, I will try to make it very clear here on this page of documents that someone could come back and look at. Other questions or comments? If not, you know, we're going to move to the next agenda item, which is the rules of order uh, that the executive committee, Vice Chair Don Rattan and Secretary Ed Peterson and I have reviewed. They're based largely on what was done in 2011. They're shorter and hopefully simplified. Um, I didn't anticipate any consideration or discussion tonight, but wanted to get them to you so that we can discuss them and adopt some rules of order at our, two, at our May 26th meeting. If you have comments, concerns, questions, or additions between now and the 26th, send them to me. Uh, but wanted to get those ahead of time as we talked about so everybody has a chance to review them uh, at least one meeting before we would act on them. Any questions about that? I'm looking at the lawyers, you know, licking their chops about we're going to. No, no whereas clauses, Zach. <laughs> okay. Hey, Greg, uh, Greg, it might be worth noting that we used uh, and start as a starting point the 2011 rules, and we did. It's essentially the same, just simplified. Okay. Well, let me let me know if you have any questions, concerns, or revisions to those. We'll, we'll talk about them early on the meeting of the 26th, and we'll vote on them. Um, next item is uh, to departmentalize or prioritize the departments and agencies we're going to hear from. Um, we are going to get you out a list um, probably tomorrow of all the departments and agencies with a, with a summary description and ask you to uh, give your view as to whether or not we want to spend time on a presentation uh, with a definitely yes, definitely no, or maybe not at this time. And then we'll look at those and we'll try to prioritize those um, and the more people that say definitely, we'll, def we'll certainly have those pr people present and give them longer time. I think if anybody wants something, wants an update on something, we'll spend some time on it, but we'll try to spend more of our time on those departments that seem more important to the larger group. So look at that. And again, I, I know we all, we're getting a lot of emails already from Linda, but Linda's working hard even on a Sunday, as you noticed yesterday. If you can respond to those sooner rather than later, so she doesn't have to send out again or a reminder, that would be helpful. The last item before our presenters, um, we are going to have the current county commissioners at the end of our County Government 101 presentations. And we're also planning to have the two former county managers, Mike Press and Hanna Zacharias, um, following the county commissioners. Um, we want, we think it would be helpful if we presented the county commissioners with some questions that the commission would like them to address rather than just have them go kind of free will it and not know what we wanted to focus on. So any questions that you would like to ask existing county commissioners about the county structure, how the charter works, their views on that, um, really anything, if you could submit those 
starting tonight or tomorrow and get those to us. We probably have a couple meetings before we get to them, but we'll start, we'll try to uh, capture all those and hopefully combine some topics, but give them some focus and some boundaries for what we want them to talk about when they present to the commission. Any questions on that process? Greg, just going back to item number four, um, when would you like to um, finish the prioritization of the departments? Is that an item for our next meeting? Yeah, or I, meetings? I'd like us, I mean, here's what we've done. Um, we as an executive kind of decided on May 26th, we're gonna do the, the big infrastructure items in the county, which are uh, the airports, wastewater, public works and, and planning. And we'll see if we can fit all four of those in. But for our June 14th meeting, we will need to know where you guys stand on other departments that you want to hear from. So uh, I guess I should put a deadline on that. We need it before June 14th if we're going to put it on the agenda for June 14th. So let's put in the minutes, Linda, and have a reminder sent. By next Chair, Wednesday. Yeah. Next Wednesday, because we will want to put them on the, probably list them on the agenda for May 26th also. Right. So the agenda, again, if, and that's a Wednesday meeting, let's, let's have them in the Wednesday before. So if you can have them in by Wednesday, May 10, 11, 12, 19th, that'll give Linda time to for all of us time to go through them on the executive committee and, and find out the top two, three or four put on the agenda for the 14th of June, flag day. Good point, Don, thank you. Uh, Eric. Thank you, Chairman. I'm happy to submit this in writing too, in your discretion, unless it's just so basic that I don't need to, but from each of the county commissioners when they come and the two prior county managers, I, I would love to know what, if any, changes each of them would propose to the charter and why. Should I send that in writing or is that what they're gonna be asked to do? I think, that's the, I think that's the pretty basic one and I don't mind just telling everybody we will, we will include something to that effect. Um, I think we want, we want to get a little more detail and some of them, you know, some of the commissioners have been there longer than others. So they'll have different views, but that's, that's what we're trying to get at here. Wendy. Oh. Oh. Okay. I thought I saw your hand up. Okay, with that, then we're gonna move into our presentations today. We talked last time about having the sheriff, the district attorney and the chief judge. Um, they are here today. Thank you all for coming. We appreciate the fact that you preside over important parts of the county government. Uh, the charter commission is convened every 10 years to review the charter. Um, our process right now, uh, because of our varying degrees of knowledge about how the county government works is to hear from different important departments in the county. Um, I don't want to get your heads too big, but after, after the county manager last time, you three are the, are the ones that we wanted to hear from. So um, our first presenter, we're going to go in the order of the agenda. Our first presenter is Sheriff Calvin Hayden. Uh, Sheriff, I know you have, and uh, you got to Linda and she submitted to everybody a couple documents this afternoon. We very much appreciate that. Um, the floor is yours and, you know, go through your presentation. We're hoping, now I will tell everybody, there are going to be questions that, that overlap on these three jurisdictions. Uh, we talked about that last time, we, or I guess at least an executive, I mean, we have law enforcement, then we have prosecution, and then we have the adjudicator, the courts. If it's a question you think that overlaps, and we can save those to the end to ask all three of them, that might be good. If you have a question that's specific to the speaker, um, then go ahead and ask that. But we're going to we're going to try to move to where we save time for questions at the end. We'll have a little time for question after each presentation. Uh, Sheriff Hayden, um, I'm not sure how I'm going to cut any of you guys off, but if we get to about 15 minutes, I might let you know that. Perfect. Thank you. 
Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for being a member of the uh, 2021 Charter Commission. It's a great review of government, and uh, I think we are lucky to have your uh, different views and opinions, and uh, we'll try to um, um, accommodate all your questions. Uh, Linda, if I was going to just talk about the uh, 2020 annual report first, okay. uh, if you could go to that one. Hate to do that to you. That's okay. Let's see here. Let me share the screen. And if you can just scroll that down, we'll just do that. And I'm going to go along with you. I've got one of my own here. Okay. Um, basically, what we're going to start out with is the sheriff's office consists of about 18 different divisions. Um, we start out with um, our civil civil and tax division. Basically that tells, uh, what that does is we serve every civil paper um, in the county almost, unless it's done by private service. Um, we do uh, evictions, um, wage collections, anything that requires personal service. Um, they literally hand out thousands and thousands of papers. Uh, they also do tag, um, property tax collections, um, car vehicle tags, they do tag enforcement, and uh, they are a great bunch. And uh, I think in 2020, they collected well over a million dollars. Um, they are operating out of the new courthouse now, a beautiful facility, thank you all for that. It is magnificent. Uh, I get to hang out here with uh, Steve Howe, who literally put his tail on the line with Ed Eilert for the, for the new courthouse. And, it's well worth it. It's a beautiful facility. Uh, if you get a chance, please take a look at it. Uh, the next is our communications division. And communications is um, um, basically run out of the Johnson County Communications Center, which is uh, 119th and Ridgeview, basically. Uh, the building is uh, capable of taking an F4 tornado hit, completely self-sustaining. We share that with the uh, Emergency Communications Center. We dispatch for 15 different entities in Johnson County, um, serve a population of about 231,000, uh, received about 265,000 calls in um, last year. 95% of the time, uh, we handled the calls in under 10 seconds or less. Um, our officers down there are unique. We, we're the envy of the state of Kansas. We get a lot of pressure to try to civilianize our communication center. But uh, the sheriff's office is unique that when you call the police, you get a certified law enforcement officer on the line. Um, that does a lot of things. It, it saves a lot of resources. We get to manage resources better. Sometimes our officers on, the, on that answer the phone can actually resolve your problem with that phone call or direct you so we don't have to use in the field police resources um, um, for uh, minor calls saves a lot of, uh, of resources doing it that way. Our communications division second to none. Uh, they're truly the best of the best and they handle a ton of calls. Next is support security. This is courthouse uh, for, this is security for the new courthouse, which uh, uh, is quite a task right now. You know, we made it through COVID this last year uh, and court, our court services were literally closed down for the better part of a year. Um, so a couple of things happened with that. Uh, our, our security services weren't needed as well, so we could put them in as much, so we could put them in other divisions, uh, which helped out with some overtime. We had a couple million dollar savings in overtime uh, and costs for the last year. Uh, with that said, it, it created some other opportunities. Um, we got to use more video courts. For years, we had tried to get our courts to try to use more video courts because we do a lot of transportation from New Century out here facility to uh, the courthouse. We had two big black buses that were back and forth every day. Well, our judges uh, uh, started using these uh, uh, video apps and they're pretty darn efficient at it. So it saved a, a, a ton of trips and a lot of money. So uh, we're hoping to be able to continue the first and second appearances uh, with uh, with video. Our, courts, our court security division is gonna be expanding 
Um, one of the new divisions we've created is uh, a security division throughout the county. The county has 92 buildings and um, security um, needs have been reevaluated this year. We hired a new security director to try to consolidate all the different uh, um, programs and, um, and equipment that they have used. So we're trying to um, come up with a consolidated alarm center, which will, um, I mean, uh, cameras are great, but if somebody's not watching them, they're pretty much worthless. So what we're trying to do is put together a, a, a consolidated alarm center to watch that. And with that, we're gonna try to incorporate a real-time crime center, but I'll talk about that a little later. But our court security is expanding uh, immensely. Uh, we're looking at perhaps doing security with the um, um, admin building. Uh, much like the courthouse. We've got the courthouse pretty well locked down. Um, so you're gonna be uh, checked if you come in, make sure that uh, our, our, our justice that's being dispersed is done without um, harassment or uh, pressure from any outside entities. Um, we are uh, um, committed to making sure that uh, our judges and staff are, are safe and be able to function um, without any undue pressure. The next is our crime lab. Our crime lab is a state-of-the-art facility, second to none anywhere in the country as far as I'm concerned. Um, we've got uh, scientists assigned up there along with a great mix of police officers uh, that, that understand, I guess the biggest thing that we do differently is you got KBI and you've got national crime labs. Sorry, you're going to hear some pounding above me. My roof's getting fixed. We're not getting bombed or anything. So it's just, we're getting better. <laughs> um, the different, different thing about our crime lab is, is if we have a drive-by shooting or we have a high priority case, it's all hands on deck. We don't just put it into the queue. Uh, a lot of, and this is really kind of a big deal with a lot of scientists. They want to make sure that things are orderly and, Everything is lined up. Well, there's emotions involved in this. And if we've got a, 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 a kid somewhere that's been injured, that we feel it's a high priority case, we go hands on deck, all hands on deck. And uh, they have done a fantastic job of uh, uh, clearing cases and working with uh, um, as a regional support. And we've been all over the state and uh, they aren't only just for Johnson County, they're a huge regional support and they are truly state of the art and best of the best. Next is our detention division. Um, this has been quite a year for detention. Uh, and it, our detention is a large part of our department. We've got several hundred officers assigned there. And our job is to compassionately um, house um, citizens that have been placed in custody and keep them safe, um, make sure their mental health is okay, their medication is, is lined out, and we've done a lot of things that we've changed in the last year or two to help with that. The biggest thing we did is we kept our jail completely COVID-free uh, to this date. We haven't had, we had a couple of cases of COVID come in. We knew about them. We kept them isolated. Uh, we have had no outbreaks of COVID in our facility, and I am completely proud of that. I think I think our officers did a great job. Um, the second thing that we've done is we brought in Johnson County Mental Health. About 80% of the inmates we have in custody have one of two problems and sometimes a combination of both, a mental health issue or substance abuse issue and sometimes a combination of the two. By bringing in Johnson County Mental Health, we can identify those clients, if you will, that have a mental health issue the minute they come in the door. So with mental health and our medical trained staff and our, our mental health trained staff in our facility, we're able to observe them, make adjustments to their medication, work together as a team and make sure that the outcomes of what we're doing with our clients are, are good for the client uh, and make sure that to ensure that they're getting good treatment, their medications are balanced out and we're addressing their mental health needs. Uh, and this is having a really good effect on reducing some of our population's recidivism. 
It also is a great opportunity to have continuum of care uh, when a person's released from custody. In, in the past, we'd give people a couple of, a couple of weeks of medication. They'd go home. Uh, they didn't have the resources or the ability to continue their care, and they'd come off their medication, and we'd see them come back in, and it was just a, a revolving door, if you will, and it wasn't very successful. Well, since we've brought in Johnson County Mental Health, there's a continuum of care. They're hooked up with resources the minute they get released, and uh, it, it seems to be working great. The other thing we just started was called MAP, and it's a medically um, assisted treatment program to help people with um, drug addiction, addiction issues. What that consists of is when a person's booked in, uh, we screen them, and if they've got a substance abuse issue, uh, we offer them treatment. And some of it may be medical treatment, some of it may be counseling and continuing um, uh, a treatment program. Some of it may be um, offering drugs such as Vivitrol, or there's a whole group of them that are blockers that block the sensation of um, craving the addicted medication or the addiction drug they're taking. Um, and we're using inmate funds to do that. And believe it or not, it's not a huge drain on our staff because with mental health being here, uh, the medical staff being here and the, and the counseling available, it's, uh, um, we're hoping that that makes a huge difference. The word is here, we're trying, our count right now is, I think today is about uh, 570. Uh, and not, not to throw um, um, stones at any other jurisdiction, but if Wichita right now is about 1,500 people. Uh, so, and we've got a smaller population or a larger population base. Uh, so we're, we're doing something right. And that's a credit to our district attorney's office, uh, our, our judges and our corrections department. We're, we've um, tried a new thing also this year with um, trying to keep low level offenders uh, to keep their jobs and keep working and go through corrections if they even pre-sentenced at times. Um, if they don't have a job, they'll help find them a job so they can get back on their feet. Um, just throwing somebody in jail doesn't really help um, behavior. Now, warehousing somebody doesn't really help. So we, what we want to do is try to give them um, a level of correction but also keep a light at the end of the tunnel. So when, the, when we release them and they've done their sentence, that they're better, not better. So a lot of exciting things happening with detention, really proud of it, and uh, uh, we're making some progress. Next is our fiscal division. Uh, in 2021, we had almost $92 million budget. Sounds crazy. Uh, but about 75% of that is salaries. Um, and our fiscal division is they do a really good job. We, uh, um, we struggled this year um, with, uh, with COVID. Uh, we are uh, um, trying to be good stewards of tax dollars. Uh, we're trying to uh, make sure that what we do, it makes fiscal sense and we don't uh, abuse tax dollars. Speaking of that, we started our own fleet service division this year. Uh, well, we actually started two years ago and so far we've saved over a million dollars by repairing our own vehicles. And uh, actually we're, we're actually buying used vehicles from Kansas Highway Patrol uh, at substantial savings uh, um, by use. They have about 50,000 miles on them and uh, using them for um, admin and staff vehicles. So huge savings there and fleet uh, services has done a great job. Investigation division is one of our divisions and we do a lot of investigations for um, Almost all of, all of the smaller jurisdictions in Johnson County, some of the Northeast cities, um, we uh, have gone all over the state doing officer-involved shootings. Again, we're kind of a regional um, um, resource uh, because our officers are really good at it. Um, we worked um, officer-involved shootings for KBI, Kansas Highway Patrol, Douglas County, Miami County. Um, uh, we've also done them for Topeka. Uh, it's just something we do to, that we, we make sure that 
to ensure that there are neutral eyes on an officer involved shooting to make sure it's done correctly and right. We get the reports done in a timely manner and we use our, our uh, crime lab to uh, make sure that, uh, that the evidence is, is uh, um, investigated and, and analyzed. We uh, solved two cold cases in the last uh, two years. Um, we just we just just made an arrest on one that was in 1985, and then I I, I think you'll um, remember the Nine Meyer case, uh, which was a tragic case in uh, Westwood. It was just solved this last year, um, so our, our investigators are killing it. They're doing a great job, and uh, very proud of the jobs they've been doing on the cold cases. One of the new things we started up was the Northeast Kansas Drug Task Force, and uh, this has been hugely successful. Uh, believe it or not, we have cartel members right here in Johnson County uh, dealing um, narcotics to our youth. Um, last year, uh, they made 192 cases. Uh, they uh, also um, dealt with um, fentanyl. Um, they busted uh, a couple of cartel dealers dealing cocaine. Uh, they made uh, a seizure of over $500,000 cash, the most cash I've ever seen in top of a mini, uh, was put in the top of a minivan in packages. Um, so it was huge, huge seizure and they're doing a great job. Um, they are uh, really doing a fantastic job. One of the, the things I'm most proud of prior to our task force, um, we had several what we call drug rips um, young people were shooting each other basically over marijuana to do uh, ripoffs. Since our drug task force initiated, we've had zero of those, and that's hard to place a value on them. Really proud of that. They've done a fantastic job. Next is our patrol division. Patrols, they patrol basically all the rural areas of Johnson County, including the cities of Edgerton and DeSoto. Uh, they, uh, uh, which about 40% of Johnson County is still unincorporated. Uh, they drove about 1.25 million miles and uh, we've got re school resources, or school, excuse me, re resource officers in DeSoto and Spring Hill. Uh, they do a great job. They, uh, our officers have uh, started with DigiTicket this year. We don't write a whole lot of tickets. Uh, um, but we do enough to uh, serve a purpose and try to educate people. So you won't see a lot of high ticket areas out of the Johnson County Sheriff's Office, but we do write tickets to serve a purpose. We have professional standards unit. Um, one of the biggest things that we have is in, in our department is, you know, two highest qualities I think you can have as a police officer is compassion and integrity. And uh, those are the two things that we want to compromise on. Um, our pro professional standard unit um, reviews every citizen complaint made against one of our officers, any racial bias complaint, any traffic stop that they feel was uh, racially motivated. Uh, every one of our officers, including our detention officers, wear body-worn cameras. We've done it for 11 or 12 years now. Um, so almost every, every action we take is um, um, recorded and reviewed. And it uh, has been a huge benefit to our officers and to our citizens, to be quite honest. Uh, it, it makes sure that, I mean, a lot of times we will make a, uh, um, an unintentional um, uh, mistake with communicating with somebody or um, to deal with um, uh, somebody's ethnic background. And we wanna make sure that we don't do that. And so we've got a uh, citizens advisory group that we meet with. We're gonna start doing it quarterly and we will review um, our video camera footage with them and uh, make sure that what we're doing isn't offensive to somebody. And if, if we do, we listen to the, we got a great group on our, our advisory committee and they're from everywhere. I mean, we've got with Hispanic leadership group, the NAACP, uh, we deal with Turkish groups. We deal with anybody we can because we consider ourselves to be everybody's sheriff's department. And uh, we're proud to be that. So um, to date, we've, we've uh, had a pretty busy year. It's kind of up this year because I think because of some of the unrest. But um, so far, our, uh, 
our, our group has given us some good advice and I think we're getting better. Property division is our property room. Uh, they take care of all the uh, um, incoming property that we recover or we uh, send to the lab for identification. Our training division uh, is uh, located up on 119th and uh, Ridgeview. We train, train usually about 60 officers a year. We've got our own academy. And uh, our, our, our academy is truly um, very, very professional. I think our training is second to none. Along with our uh, new hire academy, we also have to have 40 hours of training a year and we try to do de-escalation techniques. We have over 200 officers trained with uh, CIT training, uh, mental health crisis intervention training. And in our first academy um, um, that we bring our officers in, first thing we do is um, uh, mental health first aid. But more important than that to me is our officers that work in detention, everybody starts in detention. And you learn how to de-escalate there. You learn how to deal with people that are in mental health crisis, very proud of the communication and the, the compassion that our officers show in dealing with people. Uh, and, and I think yeah, that's I, a training. Yeah, I don't want to cut you off, but we're, we've got a little bit more than, I know you got a couple of more units, so if we can get through those quickly, we'll get to the, the district attorney. Absolutely. Uh, and the last one we've got is our warrants division, and that's where uh, all the criminal warrants come out. We serve those. They're doing a great job there. Um, again, I, I hope that we are very proud of our staff. The diversity of our staff is great right now. We pretty much reflect diversity in Johnson County. Uh, there are some areas that we need to work on, uh, but it's, it's a matter of being everybody's sheriff's department and trying to uh, keep citizens of Johnson County safe. I've been in a couple of uh, incidents this year where uh, criticized about some of uh, our tactics. We have a huge uh, social unrest team, 100 officers. And uh, the one thing I won't compromise on is the safety of our citizens. I'm open for any questions if you guys would like to do it or that pretty much wraps this up, Greg, if I can do whatever would you guys wanna do. I think what I'm gonna do is just move on to uh, Steve Howe, our district attorney. Um, Steve, if, if you can monitor the clock so I don't have to tell you. Um, I, I do see Zach has his hand up. Zach, do you want to ask that now or save it till the group? If the sheriff's gonna hang out, if the if the sheriff's gonna hang out to the end, I can wait till the end. I think sheriff right. be here. Okay. All right. Thank you, Zach. Uh, our district attorney is Steve Howe, first elected, I think, in 2008. Former assistant district attorney. Um, Steve, I'm looking for you on the screen. I see you, Greg. There you go. Floor is yours, and I'm I'm going to be a little stricter with you. I, I I drive too fast, so I'm a little worried about the sheriff. Uh, <laughs> I, I got one free get out of jail card, so I'm going to cut you off at 15. All right, fair enough. I I, I see where I'm starting off. Well, uh, good evening, to everybody, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to all of you. Uh, credit goes to all of you for taking your busy time out of your busy schedules to be involved in this and. Uh, I think this is an important process and it's also consistent with Johnson County values and government. Uh, Maury's been around for a long time and knows that we are always willing to reassess how we do our jobs and is there a better way? And you're part of that process. And so kudos to all of you for taking the opportunity to do that. Um, I'll talk about the district attorney's office. So first of all, I have a, just about a $10 million budget and I have 111 employees. Uh, nine, usually somewhere between 93 to 95% of my budget is personnel cost. Um, and so you might ask, so what do we do with that money? So let me kind of go over what our responsibilities and duties are at the Johnson County DA's office. First of all, the, the thing that we all recognize that the DA does is we prosecute criminal cases. And so I want to talk a little bit about the 7,000 cases we typically file a year um, and what, what, do we, what does that cover? 
Um, so that in, it, it involves all adult criminal cases, serious cases, felonies, and in some instances, misdemeanor violations. We also, in Johnson County, we're very unique in that all domestic violence cases, both misdemeanors and felonies, all come out to the district court. We decided to do that uh, decades ago. We really led the way uh, countrywide in, in regards to bringing all the domestic violence cases out so we could have consistency in the assessment and the disposition on those cases. And it has really been beneficial in keeping the amount of domestic violence cases down as well as homicides in that area. And we continue to do that. In fact, it's been such a great partnership that in domestic violence cases, we have two members of Safe Home embedded into our office to pro provide services to domestic violence victims along with our victim assistance unit. So um, that has worked really well um, and something that we're very proud of. We're also involved in handling all juvenile offender cases. Uh, they can range from misdemeanors to uh, felony offenses. What's really interesting is uh, even before um, the juvenile justice uh, reformation bill that was passed about five years ago, Johnson County really was the model in how we approach juvenile justice. And even today, uh, at least, I think it's right around, if not a little bit more than 50% of the cases that we handle through our juvenile justice court, uh, those cases are given deferred prosecution or diversion, whatever you want to call it. And the reason is uh, recognizing that a lot of juvenile offenders, we don't want to label them or prevent them from being able to be successful in the rest of their lives for doing stupid things for the most part, a good portion of them are. And so by doing those types of programs, it actually uh, has been very beneficial and something that the state has tried to model is the, the way that our court system, not just my office, but the entire court system, how we handle those juvenile justice cases. We're also in charge of all child in need of care cases. And those can range anywhere from truancy cases to uh, cases involving abuse and neglect. And so we are involved in that process that can be a very time consuming process um, because every, there's so many different parties. Each parent has a right to have a lawyer as well as the GAL representing the child, as well as our office. And so uh, that's an important component of our office as well. In addition to those 7,000 cases that range through those different types of, of proceedings, we also handle around 10 to 15,000 traffic cases. And those cases come from tickets issued by the Johnson County Sheriff's Office and the Kansas Highway Patrol. All other jurisdictions who write tickets, they go to their municipal courts. But the sheriff and the highway patrol, because they're not associated with a, per, a, a city, uh, we have our own traffic court to handle all those proceedings. So um, we handle 7,000 cases a year. Um, we go through our normal court procedures. Um, and as you know, the pandemic basically shut our court system down from having certain types of hearings. So we have right now a backlog of jury trials severance of parental right um, trials, as well as domestic violence and DUI trials. We have hundreds and hundreds of those backed up. And so we face a real challenge with the court system of digging out of this backlog because of basically sustain or basically stopping those, uh, those procedures because of the Sixth Amendment to the Constitution that prevents us from doing it by video. But I, I don't want you to think that over the last year we've done nothing. And in fact, um, I'm very proud of the fact that with our justice information management system and working uh, with them and the courts, uh, we've probably, the last time I checked, and it's been a little while ago, we had conducted somewhere between 40 and 45,000 hearings in court doing things like pleas, sentencing, first appearances, preliminary hearings, motion hearings over the last year. So just because we do have a, an immense backlog and a lot of work to do, we were able to minimize that by doing some really good work by the use of video technology. And a lot of credit goes to the Justice Information Management System for basically having to go from zero to 100 
because of the pandemic. It also put a lot of pressure on us. We found out we didn't have a lot of technology to be able to handle that and upgrading our systems to do it virtually because we didn't have, literally we did not have enough laptops or video cameras to handle all that. And so um, for a little while, at least the first 60 days, we actually had people using their own equipment. Uh, but there was nothing that would prepare the courts or us to be ready for something as, as uh, epic as this pandemic that we dealt with. But in addition to those duties and responsibilities, we have dozens of other statutory duties that we're required to do. Um, consumer fraud unit, we have a responsibility to help people who are taken advantage of by uh, fraudulent and deceptive businesses. Uh, we deal with all the open records and open meetings acts. And because we have so many cities, quite frankly, I do as many as probably the AG does as far as open records and open meetings complaints, recall petitions, ousters, grand juries. Um, those are all things that we deal with as well. Um, we also deal with care and treatment. So if somebody is in uh, a danger to themselves or others because of substance abuse and or mental health, we can file a petition with the court to have them be placed in an inpatient facility for their own good. And we handle, um, you know, hundreds of those as well. Um, we also handle all the appeals. So we, we do all in-house. We have all the appeals that come uh, from our court cases, as well as post-sentencing litigation, which has, over my 30-year uh, career, has probably tripled in the number of cases that we're having to deal with post-sentencing litigation. So those are some of the things that we deal with in addition to reviewing all expungements. And so uh, we're a busy office, but um, we have 36 lawyers. We have nine uh, interns who are third-year law students who have what we call a Rule 709 certification, which allows them to go to court. And I kind of equate the, the intern program as um, kind of our farm club. I'm going to use a baseball analogy and say it's like our AAA farm club. And we look and hire most of our new hires through our intern program. And it's been very, very successful over the years and continues to be one where we really, that's where our young and up and coming lawyers come from. And uh, if we've been so successful that we now see other prosecutors uh, across the state using more and more of these intern programs um, because you can kind of get an assessment. It's a year long internship. You kind of know uh, the quality of the individual instead of a lot of you have been involved in the interviews. You get an hour interview and you're like, do we really know what this person's work ethics like? Whereas if you have a year long internship, it really gives you a true measure of the individual and their strengths and weaknesses. Um, we also have investigators. We have seven investigators. Their purposes um, are one, um, we do joint investigations with other law enforcement agencies. We also help with um, some really problem um, service of uh, subpoenas uh, in really high profile cases. They also do their own investigations some of them are specialized in doing investigations involving elder abuse and dependent adults. And that requires a special type of training. Uh, we have two that do consumer fraud investigations by themselves. And then we also have individuals um, that provide uh, download of technology. So like cell phones and computers, we can also do those downloads where a lot of really good information in our criminal cases comes from those devices. So they, they play an important role. And then we have an adult and a juvenile diversion unit that is really uh, their opportunity to reach low level offenders with very little criminal history and provide them opportunities to avoid a criminal conviction. In the adult unit, we typically run around eight or 9% of those individuals and like I said, in the juvenile unit, um, we handle, there's a number of programs that are very unique to Johnson County. And that's where a lot of the services are provided to youth who are um, having problems with minor offenses. But we also provide services for truants. So people who are uh, not going to school, we have a truancy program, also trying to re-engage the family into education 
to get that kid back into the education system because we all know that if, if a kid gets a proper education it reduces the likelihood of them getting involved into the criminal justice system so that's an important piece as well um, so that is kind of the basic duties and responsibilities that we have uh, there's dozens of other minor uh, duties and responsibilities given to us by the, uh, the Kansas uh, statutes but that is probably the, the, the most significant ones that we deal with each and every day. Um, I was told, uh, I was asked a couple of questions I should answer for this um, commission. What I'm is, what is our strengths? Um, the one uh, thing that I would say is my people, the people who work for me. Um, there are many of them have been working decades uh, for this office and for the people of Johnson County. Um, they're dedicated to, to public service. And we have a really great group of people um, all through my office. Uh, I, would, I would take my group of prosecutors against anybody, include, including the U.S. Attorney's Office. I think I have a, a better group all the way across the board as far as qualified and really go-getters um, that are there to serve the, the public. The other strength that we have um, is our law enforcement community. We have a very, very professional law enforcement community, including the sheriff's office, that really does it the right way. And so many of the horror stories that we see across this country, um, it's because of the lack of professionalism in, in the organizations that they run. Whereas here, we really do a very exceptional job in training our law enforcement. Um, you know, we have one of the few co-responder programs in the country um, where each agency has a, a mental health worker that can be available to assist in those types of uh, situations. And, and I could go through the laundry list, but Greg told me he was gonna cut me off in 15 minutes, so I'll move on uh, on that. Uh, and then the other thing is our partner agencies. Um, we have been people like CASA, MOXA, Safe Home, Sunflower House, all those partner agencies that work with us each and every day, we take them for granted, but most areas of the country, when I talk about those agencies and what they do for us, people are just shaking their heads saying, I wish we had agencies like that. And we couldn't do the job that we do without having those great partner agencies. So that's a strength as well. On weaknesses, um, one of them is just, we don't control what comes in the front door. That's a weakness. We basically, we're reacting all the time. Um, so whatever comes in the front door or, or we get a notice from the jail of people in custody, that's what we deal with. And sometimes that can be a lot of stress and we can get hammered pretty hard uh, on some weeks. Um, but that is probably a weakness just of the system in general is that you have to react. You can't, you can plan only so far, but then some of it is you're just going to have to deal with what comes in the front door. Another weakness, which we can't control, is the number of different cities and entities that we have to deal with. Uh, Johnson County is very unique in the number of cities that we have in our county. And that creates some logistics issues that we've seen time and time again, because every police department has their own software system. And it creates a whole big set of problems for us in being able to get our discovery and get that produced. Well, we were lucky. So we started five years ago on this project. We wanted to get all the police departments on the same system. And so we, get, we, we went with this niche system, a software reporting system for the courts. The courts now have that, um, uh, or excuse me, the, the police departments have that. And so that has made our life a lot easier, but it's still a logistics issue dealing with so many different entities some are really small police departments, some are very, very large ones. And that creates some complexity and some issues. And that's a weakness just by how Johnson County is structured. Um, but luckily for us, one of the things that uh, we're able to do is we have good relationships with all those law enforcement agencies. And by virtue of that, uh, our communication and our ability to work together has really served the community well. Opportunities was another question. Uh, one of the opportunities we have is the fact that we have a brand new courthouse with brand new technology and, gra and brand new opportunities for us to shift some paradigms that we have right now and create some new opportunities to be effective and efficient. A good example is um, 
I think the courts, and Judge Ryan may touch on this, is getting away from having all these cattle calls, we're bringing all these people in here unnecessarily um, all the time. Uh, the pandemic showed us that we can do this differently and it's been highly effective and, and gives opportunities for criminal defendants not to miss so much work and therefore not put them at an even greater risk to uh, be behind the eight ball, so to speak. So uh, we're gonna be able to create some efficiencies because of our switch over and our technology. A good example of this is uh, we just noticed out today that starting June 1st, we're gonna do e-discovery. So we're no longer are we gonna make computer disks full of the discovery provided to the criminal defense attorneys. They will be able to log on and access the data online with a login uh, code and be able to get all the data right there. So they don't have to spend the time coming back and forth to our office and they can just download it at their own convenience and be able to access that information. And so those are opportunities that we're going to seize with this new courthouse as we have a new beginning. And then the other opportunities as this county continues to grow, we're at 600,000 and we're just continuing to grow at a, an incredible pace. There's an opportunity for us to examine what are the uh, priorities for the county and assessing as we move on what we need to do to best serve the, the population and keep this community safe. So that is my spiel. Hopefully I'm under the gun so Greg isn't upset, um, but um, I'm willing to stand for questions, whatever you like. And Greg, you're muted. Go ahead and uh, hear from Judge Ryan and then we will uh, they have questions for all of them. Some, several people have put questions in the chat. Um, and so those, those will be fair game. Uh, uh, let me introduce now Judge Kelly Ryan. He is the Chief Judge of the Johnson County District Court. Um, I'm not sure how many years now Kelly has been Chief Judge. That rotates, uh, but he's been on the bench um, for a while and uh, knows what's going on in the court system, including the new courthouse and the move. So Judge Ryan. Great. Thank you very much, Greg. I guess since you're concerned about speeding and you gave the sheriff all that time and you're kind of worried about the prosecutor, since you ultimately end up here, I get as much time as I want. Is that it? Yes, Your Honor. That's what I always say. <laughs> I, I will not do that. I, I, I think you purposely put me at the end to give me a finite time. Um, thank you, Greg, and thank you to all of you for serving on the commission. Um, we do appreciate your uh, dedication, your public service of reviewing uh, everything about our county and what makes it great and to continue our progress that uh, we do uh, continually, I believe here uh, in Johnson County. With a limited amount of time, um, I'm gonna go through somewhat education about Johnson County courts, also about courts in general because we started back in 2014, a civics education uh, program that we would go out to all sorts of uh, schools, organizations, um, wherever that would listen to talk about the court system. Kind of a PR move, but to also educate people. And the numbers are frightening that literally you can find studies anywhere for polling people asking, what are, name the three branches of government more than 50% can't name all three branches. So we continue to have our uh, job ahead of us to educate people. Um, I'm gonna try to share the screen here if I can. And I'm not sure if that's... It's not up not. yet. Have Is you it on there or not? No, have you hit share screen first and then picked what you wanna share? Yes, I hit share screen first. Well, would you like me to share? Yeah, go ahead oh. if you will, that's fine. Okay. Hey. No, I'm still in this charter commission deal, I'm muted, what's up? Sheriff, you aren't muted. Hang on. I'm not. 
Uh, if you just go to the slideshow part there, great. Thank you. All right. Um, we'll do this the difficult way, the uh, old fashioned way, showing the technology uh, of how the courts are able to manage this. Um, Linda, if you hit the next one. Literally, we're trying to emphasize remembering the judicial branch, the third branch of government is made up in the state courts from the Supreme Court, the Kansas Court of Appeals, there are district courts and municipal courts. We're gonna talk about the district court here. There are 105 counties in Kansas and those 105 counties are gathered together into 31 judicial districts. Johnson County is the 10th judicial district and it is the only county uh, because of its size, the large metropolitan areas are their own districts. And if you could hit the next one. And as the courts are defined, what a trial court is, this is where 95% of people who have contact with the courts are either in municipal court or district court. We have over 400,000 people a year that come into the courthouse pre-pandemic, but that tells you how many uh, people's lives were affecting, not just Johnson County, but other people who transact business either legally or otherwise in Johnson County. We handle all of these different uh, types of cases that you'll see here, and we'll, I'll show you that here in the next couple of slides. And as pointed out, this is the, this is the place where criminal and civil jury trials take place. Linda. Johnson County, a, the organizational structure you'll see here is Sorry. That's all right. There we go. All right. Um, it is made up of 23 different divisions. There are 19 district court judges and four magistrate judges. Those district court judges have general jurisdiction over all matters that can be heard in state court. The district magistrate judges have limited jurisdiction over uh, certain caps on the amount of uh, disputes, the amounts at issue, um, thus the term limited actions, small claims. Uh, they also hear traffic matters, certain juvenile cases. Um, we've had the 23 judges here now. I believe the last additional judge was added in 2008. The state has authorized us for an additional district court judge, but it, that funding has not come through in the past 13 years. And Greg, you're asking when I started, I started in 2008, and I kind of take that personally that that might be part of the reason we haven't added to the uh, judges yet. Um, all of these organizations here come under the umbrella of the courts, everything from the district court trustee, law librarian. Um, I will point out, we have a new court administrator, Laura Brewer, who started March 22nd. She has worked uh, in the court services uh, division for the courts for more than 20 years. So she brings a wealth of experience. Um, she's gonna she's have a little bit of a beginner's curve, even having known all the players and know what's going on in court, being a court administrator is a, a pretty uh, tremendous job. She has a deputy court administrator, which we were able to uh, fund through the state uh, as we have to do with everything. Uh, and that is Andre Tyler. There are three hearing officers you'll see there that hear child support matters generally through the trustee's office. Also a uh, part of our court system is the court reporters, the administrative assistants for the judges. There is the clerk of the district court's office. And then we also have court services officers. All told there are approximately, and I say this approximately because it changes almost daily it seems, 175 employees or the district court here in Johnson County. Linda? The types of cases that we hear, <clears throat> you'll see that covers literally everything um, that is not otherwise heard in municipal courts. Criminal uh, makes up a large part of that, and you'll see how we break that down in the assignments to the judges here in a moment, but it includes felonies. It includes misdemeanors. It literally covers everything from a DUI all the way up to capital murder. Traffic cases and juvenile court is also, all of those matters are all heard here in the district court. On the civil side, 
all damage suits, all divorce and related family law matters, which are domestic cases. Protections are protection from abuse, protection from stalking and other um, related matters that many times come out of domestic violence situations. Probate and estates is the general probate court and guardianships and conservatorships, which are also through our probate court. I'm gonna quickly show you here just how it's broken down. We have six judges currently hearing adult criminal cases. That is the largest group of any divisions within the district court because of the volume of criminal cases here in Johnson County. The next slide shows the judges, shows six judges in the civil department. Judge Draghi in division eight is added in there because probate is, we included that under the civil, but the other five judges here exclusively civil cases. Next slide are five family court judges. And I wanna <clears throat> bring up one point, Johnson County back in 2006, well ahead of the curve of most any courts around, certainly in Kansas, but certainly I think throughout the, the region, developed and started a family court meant for those judges that hear only divorce, parentage and related matters um, to get a particular uh, uh, specialty, if you will, in dealing with families, which a court system is not a great way to deal with family matters, but that's the system we have. And the whole point of this was the concept of a problem solving court. It's to utilize all of the social services and other aspects to help people make uh, a, one of the toughest times of their lives to get them through that and try to cut down on the division, the acrimony that always cover, always seems to follow in family cases. But we're very proud that, and we've continued to do that since 2006 and it's now developed <clears throat> into five divisions hearing those cases, which indicates to you how many divorce actions are heard in Johnson County. The next group of judges is juvenile. There are four judges. Um, Judge Cameron hears only juvenile offender cases. Judge Ashford hears the lower level or misdemeanor and lower level felony juvenile offender cases and uh, the uh, truancy cases for children who are not attending school regularly, which is a uh, burgeoning, uh, always seems to be a large part of a docket. Judge Sloan has heard child need of care cases for throughout her career, I believe over 15 years now. And Judge Schoenig is now taken because of the number of uh, what we call SYNC, C-I-N-C, SYNC cases. She has a half docket in addition to a half docket of family cases. Finally, we have the magistrates. We have four magistrates and this covers what they, um, what they are duties cover. Judge Scott has small claims, traffic, and protections. Those are protection from abuse and protection from stalking. Judge Ashford with the juvenile offender and truancies. Judge Vokens handles all of the charging, initial charging and arraignments in criminal and then limited actions, which includes evictions uh, and other uh, limited jurisdiction cases. Judge Phelan probably should have put a little bit better than saying just misdemeanors. He hears exclusively domestic violence cases, um, the misdemeanor cases there. And he has one of the largest dockets, unfortunately, of, uh, of any of the courts for volumes of people coming through uh, our doors. The next couple slides that we'll show just quickly as far as case filings, and uh, Steve is, is certainly aware of the numbers both in criminal, traffic is, is uh, it is uh, always escalating, but these numbers you'll see here as it's broken down, even in 2020, there was not a real reduction in filings because of the pandemic. The misdemeanor cases are, are a lesser number, but that is the reason that we have six of our 19 district court judges hearing criminal matters. I also have just a quick chart on juvenile cases and they did go down somewhat during the pandemic. And you'll notice the truancy numbers went way down. That was because schools were not in session for from spring break until through summer. 
in essence last year and then the reduced the on and off again scheduling and the remote learning uh, that truancy matters just weren't um, it wasn't it was not a, a matter that was reported on a regular basis finally on the civil case filings that covers both divorce civil actions protections from abuse and stalking all the things that you can see there um, which those that group of judges hears the next chart we have is on jury trials which understandably were short-circuited on March 18th was the last juror to walk out of the old courthouse. We made plans beginning as early as June to restart jury trials. We then pushed that to August. Then we pushed it to September. We finally pushed it to October and we met regularly with Dr. Lamaster and health department officials throughout since March of last year and we still meet with them bi-weekly now, not weekly, uh, for their advice on how to restart and bring people back into the courthouse when this would be literally a large petri dish, admittedly, because it's not just a shopping mall, it's where you're ordering people and requiring people to come in. So we were not able to do that. By the time we then moved over here to the new courthouse, we were in another surge. And I'm happy to report that we had our first jury trial on May the 3rd, last Monday and we will be resuming full jury trial schedules for criminal cases primarily starting June the 7th. The civil cases will not resume until September because some of the civil judges are helping with some of these criminal cases as well. But we're hoping by the fall that we'll be back to resuming uh, full jury trial schedules, both civil and criminal. And as Steve noted, we have uh, a backlog of at least 300 jury trials that we will, we are working with all the attorneys and the parties now to get those scheduled and we've booked them up. We are, we will be regularly handling a multiple cases every week through the end of 2022 and probably beyond to get through the, not just the backlog, but also what continues to come in the doors because those numbers have not come, come down either. On the next slide, we should have the Average hearings. This is one of the, the points that Steve brought up too, in that I'm very proud of uh, the fact that despite what um, I had heard, had heard reports and actually saw a, a video of legislators indicating that Johnson County had closed court, closed court since March of last year. In fact, for the first two weeks, essentially the second and third week of March, we worked with the district attorney's office, with the sheriff's office and with uh, the defense bar. We took a look at all of the people in custody at that time and cooperated between all of those groups to reduce the jail population by over 200 inmates during those two weeks. That helped start the method uh, which Sheriff Hayden was able to uh, maintain and have that record of not having any uh, COVID outbreak in our jails, as opposed to many other, uh, we see that on the other side of the state line, Cedric County had large outbreaks as well. But if you'll also notice the numbers went down in February, but started coming back up in April and we returned back to essentially to normal. We went down in December because we had reduced hearings due to the move to the new courthouse. But the last reported numbers we had was through the end of November of 2020. The exact number was 59,000 hearings were held remotely. We did not close down. The only, the only thing we did not do were jury trials. We had trials to the court by video. We had preliminary hearings, suppression motions, divorce trials, sentencings. We had all of the court functions were going on remotely. And I am absolutely positive, but I have not yet been able to confirm, but I'm certain that Johnson County continued court at the rate closest to pre-pandemic times throughout the entire year up to now. And we continue to do these things remotely. As the sheriff pointed out, we have, um, <laughs> a pandemic can be a good motivator for change. The law, and lawyers and judges are set in their ways many times. 
And we don't wanna ever change things just to change them, but when a better way comes along, you better latch on to it, and we have, for reducing the number of actual appearances in court. You're still in court, but you're done doing that by video. The uh, legislation that we were pushing and unfortunately got stopped when the legislature closed in uh, April of 2020, it was passed this year to allow for hearings other than first appearance for the, the defendant can appear remotely. That was pushed by our, our staff, uh, along with uh, Office of Judicial Administration. We got support from the Johnson County legislators. And what that does, the sheriff mentioned, reducing the cost of transportation over a million dollars in one year, just to transport prisoners, people or inmates from either Gardner or here across the street and bring them into court. It's a massive undertaking that no one really ever sees or understands until you see it happen. And that million dollars is saved, which ties into the ability to have people appear in court when they don't have to take a day off work just to come out for a scheduling hearing and spend 15 minutes maybe in court. So we will continue to develop that and use that along with in-person hearings. How are we doing, a couple of things I do want to point out. Um, we have our district court budget. It's mostly coming from uh, salaries that is uh, the responsibility of the state. The judicial branch pays the salaries of our state employees. The, the strengths and weaknesses are our strength is the state and the county and our weakness is the state and the county because there are it's a hard meld. The district court budget for operations is funded by the county. That is covers all of those things, including the courthouse, which is, is uh, Steve mentioned, I think Sheriff mentioned is a, a fantastic building that we're getting used to and starting to fill up because more people are coming in now. But um, most of our salary, both statewide and obviously here in Johns County is for salary. It's, it's not hard assets. The hard assets are provided by the county. And that usually is a give or take a round number about six to six and a half million dollar budget that the county supports the courts for operations. And that is by statute. It's KSA 20-348. A couple last things, because I know uh, we're getting to the end here. Greg needs to uh, cut me off, but I want to point out some of the things that Johnson County District Court as being an innovator, um, and you can take that one off. That's talking about salary. I, I will mention the legislator, legislature just passed a budget for salary enhancement for the first time since 2007 for the judicial branch. It will bring our staff employees up to market rate over the coming fiscal year and the next year. It's upwards of, in some positions, it's 18% below market. So over the course of those two years, those positions will be brought up to market rate. That will help us be able to fill our open positions, which were bad before the pandemic and they were exacerbated because of the pandemic. Our clerk's office at worst in March of this year was down 27% of a staff reduction. They had 27% of their open positions were open at that time. We're hoping that this salary increase will help that. Johnson County was the first and still is the only uh, district in the state of Kansas that has a veterans treatment court that we started in 2016. We're very proud of that. We also developed starting in 2014, a self-help center for the continuing increase of number of people who cannot afford an attorney or choose not to pay an attorney and wanna represent themselves in court. There's lots of those both in the limited actions, but mostly in family court type situations. When you come into the courthouse and you see the clerk's office and off to the left, we have a beautiful, large area for that very purpose. Uh, I'm always happy to answer questions about that if you have any. We're also part of the overall criminal justice system, pretrial justice, the task force that was um, created by the, or the Kansas Supreme Court that Chief Judge uh, Karen Olberger uh, headed. We are looking at that, that ties into 
our work here that's been ongoing in Johnson County for a pretrial risk assessment to get people out of custody and have them can be able to continue their job, not lose their job by being in jail with a bond that's too high for them. We've also developed an assisted outpatient treatment court for the uh, persons on the care and treatment docket. And we also have a juvenile drug court that's just begun in the past 12 months. So we're very proud of the things that we've done and we have many more things in the hopper and continue to make these changes because Johnson County District Court is a leader in the state of Kansas without question and throughout this region in the Midwest. Greg. Thank you, Judge. Uh, we are we have 25 minutes left for questions. Um, I'll, I'll ask each of each of you, Sheriff and DA and Chief Judge, to try to keep your answers shorter if you can, so we can get as many questions in as possible. And remember, our our role is to determine um, how the charter structure is or is not working, as opposed to too far into the weeds if we can. But there are lots of things that have been raised here. Um, with respect to those, several have, of you have uh, placed your questions in the chat. If you want to ask those, uh, now would be the time to do it, or I can ask them because I've cut and pasted them. So who wants to go first with a question? Uh, identify yourself and who you want to answer. Zach, you've got your hands up. You were first. Go. You're muted, Zach. Yeah. Forgot I turned it on. I've got to do the temporary. Sorry. Thank you, Chairman. First question is for Sheriff Hayden. It's actually two-part. I had a follow-up. Um, and I guess all presenters, kind of, for those that have never served on the commission, which is most of us, how can the charter help or benefit you? What changes do you want to see be made? And I guess keep it limited. But then secondly, and more specifically, Sheriff, you talked about zero drug rips since the drug task force was put in place. Is it, did I hear that right? No, what we said is there dr zero drug rip murders. Since we had when? several before. Um, they have stopped since we uh, put our uh, drug task force in. When did that start? Uh, last uh, year, we had a we had about three of them. Uh, several of them in Olathe and, and in Overland Park. Young kids. I guess in the about what you want to see the charter, how it impacts your office. What um. The charter um, doesn't really impact us in a long way unless it's um, um, to, to help us um, 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 I mean we, we've got a really good working relationship with everything we've got going on now. I mean there aren't any really negative impacts um, unless it's maybe getting some of our elected officials back. Um, I mean we uh, uh, several of our elected officials were eliminated um, in the first charter. And uh, to me, um, having sat on the commission and having been involved, um, when you lo lose elected officials, I think you lose connection with government. And we lost two or three with the first charter. Um, something for you guys to think about. Steve or Judge... Ryan, those are those are that's a good basic question to start with. Your your relationship with the charter within the structure of the county government, good, bad, ugly changes. Um, mine could probably be pretty quickly. That's the the dichotomy that I spoke about before is because we are the state. We're a state uh, branch of government that's working with the county. We work with the district attorney, the sheriff's office every aspect and agency throughout the county is in one way or another impacted or involved with the courts. Um, so we have to, we have ongoing uh, opportunities to try to coordinate that and work collectively with each other. But as far as the charter commission and, and any, imp, any recommendations um, other than making, making the county agencies that we work with, um, receptive and available for us. That's about as far as we can really ask, ask for, I think. I would say that uh, I have a great working relationship with the county and the county commission. And so I'm, I have no complaints whatsoever. And I think we, there's, I don't see a pressing need to change wholesale anything because we are considered a high performing organization, both the criminal justice system, as well as the county itself, and we've received a lot of 
awards for our work in criminal justice as well as our work um, as a county as a whole. And we do very collaborative efforts. And so I see no real problems. I saw a Chris and then Joy. Joy, if you'll wait, let Chris go. Yeah, Judge uh, Ryan, do you consider the uh, Johnson County Public Defender's Office to be adequately funded and staffed? Um, that's a, an excellent question. I just saw your question on there, Chris. Um, I don't. I don't think they. I don't think there's anyone that can say that they are adequately staffed and funded because they have to shut down. They just finished a four-week shutdown that where they could take no new cases. Um, that has been occurring even before the pandemic, I believe, on average, about twice a year. So two months out of the year, they're not taking any new cases because their caseloads are exceeding their manpower. Um, and when they are functioning at full rate, there's the statewide push to try to get supplemental funding for them on a statewide basis because the attorneys are not both in the public defender's office and those who are paid through that system to represent people who are appointed by the court, they are paid a third of what they should be paid probably uh, on an hourly rate. Now the public defender's office has asked for, they have a whole package of trying to have increase uh, in their funding for salaries and to be able to hire both attorneys and more investigators. But that, that applies just as much here in Johnson County as it does anywhere else in the state. I would say, Judge Ryan, right. who yes. funds that just so we can figure out whether the, it is in fact a county charter matter? The state, the state funds okay. the public defender really? system. Now, now the, the county will have some contractual, for instance, the county pays, there's a contract um, set up for appointment of attorneys in juvenile court. And that has been streamlined over the past six to eight years. Uh, instead of a whole variety of attorneys, um, and we've cut down the number on that from close to a million and a half a year, it's down under a million dollars now. But that's, that's a big chunk of what has to be paid for services to the courts. That's appointing counsel for juvenile offenders and child need of care cases, uh, everything that comes, comes under the uh, uh, juvenile court system. Joy. Then Brenda. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you, Chairman Musil. And thank, thank you all for being here tonight and for sharing your expertise and for the work that you do for our community. I, I'm just really grateful for, for all of that. Uh, Sheriff Hayden, could you elaborate a little bit more on your earlier comment about elected officials? I didn't quite understand um, that comment. Could you just elaborate on that a little bit? I'd be happy to. Um, when, the, when the Charter Commission was first um, suggested. They, end, they did away with the register of deeds, uh, the county treasurer, and the county clerk. Those are now all appointed positions. Those were elected positions that were, that were eliminated. Now, to me, um, we've had some problems in those areas. Um, I, I, we, we've had, um, especially with our our, our county clerk and some things like that. We've had, and you have appointed officials that aren't accountable to the elector. And so what happens is um, we keep pushing a can down the road when the problem is, is that there's nobody that's accountable. Are, are they not accountable to the county commissioners? Well, they're accountable to um, the judges um, and, and things like that. But Right. They're not. They're not held to that standard of being elected official. You don't like what I do. You don't have to vote for me. You can get rid of me next year. Uh, but we've had some issues, and some of those issues are because I think directly because um, there's not an elected official in charge of them. Thank you for that clarification. I appreciate that. Thank you. Come back. Hi. Um Brenda Sharp here. Thank you again for your presentation tonight. Our charter commission, in my opinion, is established to represent all Johnson Countyans. And so I'm curious if you could 
share with us how um, each of your officers monitors racial equity processes, practices in terms of arrest, diversions and prosecution, um, conviction, sentencing, et cetera. What kind of processes are in place to be sure we're meeting the needs of all of our citizens? I I'll start with that because I, I start with the arrests, if that's okay with you, Steve. Okay, go ahead. Um, when we um, do traffic stops, um, we report every contact that we have. That report is uh, sent to the KBI and uh, we also review it to make sure that there's not uh, racial inequities in every, anything we do. Um, now, that said, as far as our jail population, um, I, I'm in charge of my department, but when, we, when, when other agencies make arrests, we pretty much take what, what we're dealt as far as our jail population. But we try to, and I, I'm sure every other uh, police department in Johnson County um, has the same um, information and the same demographic data that we try to make sure that what, what our officers are doing is not motivated uh, to single out any group whatsoever. After that goes to the district attorney's office and then the judges. So, um, but we don't have much control over who's housed in our detention center. I, I would say, Brenda, that um, in 2016, the Burns Institute uh, was hired to do a study on the juvenile justice system for that very, very reason, to make sure that we were doing things the right way and there wasn't any racial disparity. And then in 2018, they issued a report about Johnson County. And if you uh, ask the Criminal Justice Advisory Council, they can get you a copy. Allie can get you a copy of that. But it's actually a pretty positive report from the Burns Institute about what we did. We did end up tweaking some things that they felt would be beneficial in making like diversion easier and uh, for um, people of, of different minorities to have access to those type of services. But it was a very glowing report. And uh, I think it showed that we were doing things right. And so there has been some efforts uh, by Johnson County to address those issues. And I think, like we said, we're always willing to reassess what we're doing and can we do better? Brenda, as far as the, from the court system, <clears throat> in one aspect, we can't really keep track of numbers and assessing people just by classifications. In essence, you really do need to say, look at everyone as a, as a whole. That being said, the statistics are always maintained as far as ages, race, all of the uh, factors are maintained by the state uh, and it's in the annual report. We don't have the annual report out yet for 2020 for the judicial branch, but they do take a look at that as far as you can, there is data to back up what the racial mix is, if you will, of in sentencings or in dispositions of cases. We are looking at also in our fair cross-section of the community that we're required to bring in for jurors to hear cases. We're very attuned to that and trying to gather that data, especially now in the new, new dawn of uh, returning back to jury trials, that we have a renewed commitment to that. And as I mentioned, another point before was that pretrial justice task force uh, created by the Supreme Court that started and I believe in 2018. So this wasn't a, uh, any uh, reaction to the past year of, um, of the heightened senses that we have and all the problems that have come about for the pandemic. Their work has been going on for several years and they have a whole, they have a, a very comprehensive report that they are suggesting looking at, not necessarily just racial, but it's looking at the investment in the criminal justice system and trying to get people out from underneath the debt, not just of traffic fines, but also of bonds, pretrial supervision, probation, all of those things that put people in a position where uh, they're more likely to lose their job, lose their home, lose their family, if they're incarcerated for too lengthy a period of time based upon their particular circumstance. So we're looking at those, those parts in the courts here as we go forward as well. Thank you all. 
Mayor Bain. Good evening. Um, as I put the lens of, is it charter commission reviewable or not? Um, I'm not sure this gets there by the same token. I, I'm very curious and it may. Uh, when the sheriff was talking, uh, he talked about 40% 40, 40 of the county being unincorporated. And I'm thinking, who's paying budgets? 40% is, is the rural area covering the cost of the sheriff at 40%. He adds in that we have a couple of cities that are using the sheriff as their police departments. Then I hear the district attorney talk about quasi what I'll call municipal functions, although it's if the sheriff writes the ticket or if the highway patrol writes the ticket, it goes to the DA's office rather than the local community. And then I heard Judge uh, Ryan talk about, well, we're running courts to do those things as well. So all of this kind of comes together in who's paying for what. I know that the state pays a lot of the court budget, but and I'm not sure these are questions directed at any of you. I didn't think of them. I anticipated this when I think about this, though, that the planning departments for the county are only have jurisdiction only in the 40 percent. So I'm curious from an overhead perspective, and this maybe needs to go back to the budget director or the city manager and be asked at some point. So with that long setup uh, that I don't really expect an answer to tonight, is it possible that we can get data that would show us who's paying in the 40, 60% uh, rural, I'm, I'm sorry, not rural, but unincorporated and cor in, incorporated, is that data available? And if, if someone were to come to you from the budget office or the city manager's office to answer that question, would you have that available? It's probably, I don't need the data tonight, but I'm curious if we're tracking it that way, even. You know, uh, Mr. Mayor, I, I can give that as a, as a resident of rural Johnson County. Um, my most of, and mo a lot of our budget comes from ad valorem property taxes. A lot of yours as a city comes from a lot of sales taxes. So it's, it's a lot of, I mean, we're dependent on taxes as we go, but um, rural Johnson County, I don't have curbs and gutters and street lights and all those things that the, the city amenities have got. But, um, you know, we all have to pay our, our, our home taxes, real estate taxes is where the big majority of ours comes from. Um, those, those rates are kept um, by the county treasurer's office, and you can look at those. They're pretty interesting, but um, there's not that big a discrepancy. Uh, it, it, it's pretty, it, it's an amazing thing to look at, but yes, they're available. Steve or Judge Ryan, anything to add to that? One thing that I've heard a couple things mentioned is the Citizens Advisory Group on Criminal Justice. Could somebody tell us more about that because it seems like it overlays all of your work and it is a place to get to some of the social equity questions that Brenda asked, as well as just the structure of our criminal justice system. Yeah, the Criminal Justice Advisory Council has been in place for, oh, I can't remember when it was established. Annabeth Serbal was the chair of the county commission at the time. And it really has played a big role in making sure we have collaborative efforts throughout the criminal justice system. It was the group that helped facilitate the co-responder program with our mental health department and other components of our criminal justice system and why we're considered like one of the top 10 counties in the entire country as far as our reform efforts. So I would suggest Allie Dickinson is the, the director of CJAC um, and she would have a lot of the data you're asking for. Um, I think someone was asking about mental health and data related to does it reduce the prison population? We actually had a study done. And so we do have that data that can provide that to this group as far as the successes of some of those programs. So I would agree, Greg, I think reaching out to, to, to see Jack and getting some of that data would satisfy some of your, your questions. And Greg, there's, there's also the corollary for juvenile as well. There's a juvenile advisory board that you could get from that perspective. That's called JCAB. So those two groups will help you. You guys will hear about CJAC, it's what they call it, Criminal Justice Advisory Committee. And it's made up of um, police officers, former offenders, faith-based people, um, 
um, community um, outreach um, people. I mean, uh, former um, educators. I mean, it is it is a cross section of the community, and it is it, it's amazing some of the uh, the perspectives that you see when you get a full 360 perspective of, of community justice pro, uh, issues we have. And uh, it's, it's super valuable, it really is. I, I can see that by the time we get through County Government 101, we may have other questions that are more structural related to the, how the charter works. And as uh, the mayor put it, are they, is it charter commission reviewable? Um, and so what I think we'd probably like to do is with your, with your uh, indulgence, when we get to that point, we may get back to you with some written questions about how the structure works for your office. Uh, if there are impediments, uh, Judge Ryan, I, I feel most for you, well, both you and the district attorney, I guess, in the sense that you're, you're so wrapped up in state funding and state mandates, but yet the county has a role that you have to play uh, for both Steve and Cal. Uh, but I, I think we're, we're still kind of feeling our way about what a charter commission is supposed to do from a structural standpoint and analyzing how different parts of government, government uh, reacts to one another and coordinates and cooperates. And, and if there's a way that uh, there's some compelling need to fix that, that's what we're looking for. So um, I really appreciate the time you put together. Uh, we have a couple minutes if there are any last questions for these three gentlemen. Uh, Randy. Thank you, Chairman Mitchell. Um, first of all, Sheriff Hayden, I'd like to compliment you for stating what you did. Um, I believe that you, if you were not an elected official, you wouldn't be comfortable saying what you did. So first of all, thank you for that. Um, I do have a question for Judge Ryan. Reflecting back on the last election, over half of the ballots seemed to be made up of judges, of which discussion following that with different citizens, families, et cetera, none of us felt comfortable in what we were actually voting for when it came to the judges. We didn't have a party affiliation that we could, that we could understand at least what their core values were. There really weren't choices to be made in the judges. I guess what, from your perspective, could be done to enhance that, pro that process to where we could feel, if nothing else, more informed or more educated about what we were actually voting for? Well, Randy, I, I think that's what I was talking about, our civics course. We just call it Civics 101 that we started in 2015 going out to uh, the community. I guess to the extent, if the county can help us with going out to explaining the merit selection process that was last on the ballot. It was changed back in the early 70s. It was on the ballot again for the county whether or not to run um, by party affiliation and have contested races as other um, public officials were elected and maintained and kept, stayed with the merit selection process. That's a whole nother presentation that I, I could give you, but I, I think, um, in trying to get the information out for a period of, I think, four years, the legislature funded a commission that would review judges throughout the state, not just Johnson County, but anyone who's in a merit selection to have evaluations done by not just the attorneys, but the parties who appeared in court, the, the uh, members of the public who came in, many of them, again, being self-represented, they came in and they would be able to fill out their, their evaluation of a particular judge as long as they were appearing or had something to do with that court. They accumulated all that information and published a report. The legislature defunded it after four years and that I think ended in 2010. So the only thing that we've, we've been able to do is through the Johnson County Bar Association, we now have every two years, not just the judges who are on the ballot that particular election year, but all judges that they do an evaluation of the same type just for Johnson County judges. And their, their uh, response rate for people answering those questionnaires have continued to grow as, as we put that information out. But that's really about the most information that the public has access to immediately, short of 
as we always say, come to the courthouse and see what it is we do and come sit in a courtroom and, and, to, and see what, what's happening every day that most of what's going on in court is not covered by the news. It's 1% you know, of the high profile things that are covered. But I encourage any, any of you that would wanna to come to the courthouse to, to sit in and watch a particular type of docket. I'd be happy to set that up for you. You can come into my courtroom and, and do that. I'd, I'd be happy to because it is eye-opening of what's going on in Johnson County. You get a real sense of that in the court system. Now, criminal to a certain extent probably outweighs that, but just to see the, the business litigation that comes through here that, that is handled by the judges and the ju judicial staff here, um, I, I think it would be very educational for anyone who wants to do that. But unfortunately, there's not a way to publicize that because we are not permitted to campaign. We can't, we can't go out and, and toot our own horn basically about that. We do as best we can by partnering with lawyers when we go out and do these civics educations, but we're not, we're not there to tout myself as a judge and you should retain me, but that's the system that's been in place, I think since 1972 here in Johnson County. And Randy, I'll tell you that, that is established by state statute. So I, it's a good question about how we do it. And I think we've tried various ways to get that information out, but it, you're not the first one that said that to any lawyer in this group that, you know, they call and say, what about these judges? And there's a long list of them at the, there at the end of the ballot. So um, thank you to uh, the sheriff, the DA and the judge. Thank you so much for joining us. We are at our six o'clock stop point. Our next meeting will be, yes, Judge Ryan. Real quickly, because I just now saw another question. Can people, set, can you either save that and send it to me? I know Chris just sent me another uh, message that I could respond to them, or can you send those to us from the chat? Judge, um, we will get a copy of the chat and we'll go through and make sure they've all been answered or have each Great. area answer those. Great. So okay. We will get that done. Great. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank the three of you for giving us your time and your public service. Uh, we'll probably be back in touch at some point. For members of the commission, we are uh, next going to get together on May 26th, 4 o'clock. Um, probably by Zoom, we'll, if not, we'll let you know. We're trying to get to an in-person meeting. I think that would be beneficial for all of us. Uh, we're getting to know each other a little bit by Zoom, but you can't do it as well on Zoom as you can looking across the table. So um, there is no other business to come before us. I'd accept a motion to adjourn. So moved, Chris Iliff. Second. Moved by Chris Iliff, seconded by a voice. Zach Thomas. Zach, Zach, Thomas. Zach Thomas. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed no. Thank you all very much. We'll continue our lessons on May 26th. And Chairman Hussle. Chairman yes, Musel, Don Roberts did come in during the meeting. I have the time noted, so he was I, here also. I, I saw that. Yes. Thank you. All mm -hmm. right, everybody. Stay safe. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you.